Well, if you haven't had the opportunity to um, join with us over this first uh, three or four days of this week, we've been kind of going through verse three of chapter one in the book of Titus and talking a lot about time where we looked on Monday about how that God is the Lord, the master of time. He created it. He controls it. And so the Tuesday, we looked at the idea of God's timeliness, that, that the things that take place in my life are not accidents. Uh, they're not just the cause of some kind of uncontrolled circumstantial events or happenstance, that God is at work in my life. And whether God has created the dynamics, I know for sure that he has used those dynamics. If there's things that God doesn't want in my life, he can keep them out. And the things that find their way in are either there because of my drifting and disobedience, which again, God will use to bring me into compliance with his will, or they're there because God really needs to teach me something that otherwise I would not learn. And so I call them divine interruptions. <laughs> I don't always appreciate them. In fact, you can find me sometimes complaining about them, but the reality is God knows what he's doing. He knows what he's about. And basically what he we talked about thirdly on Wednesday was that God said the timing of his gospel coming into the world was according to his plan, that the, the gospel that was somewhat concealed in the Old Testament was um, brightly revealed in the New Testament. And I shared some of my own stories in regards to that. But we also talked about, so what is the gospel? And, and when I read out of Revelation chapter 14. So today, what do I want to look at? I want to look at how God uh, communicates that gospel. How does he get that gospel out into the world? And Paul tells us in the last part of verse 3, he says that it was a gospel that was entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. In other words, Paul often tells us that he became an apostle because, as he says in his introductions over and over again, that he is the slave of Jesus Christ. He is the purchased property of God who uses him for his purpose and his design. And God's design for Paul's life and specifically was to be an apostle or a messenger, somebody who would go around the world sharing with other people the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as I said yesterday, in order to really effectively preach to somebody, they have to recognize a deep need in themselves for the gospel. Uh, it's only as I remember, realize that I am a sinner and that I have failed miserably at trying to organize and direct my own life, that I can come to a place of absolute surrender and say, God, forgive me for my sins and have mercy upon me, a sinner, that the grace of God, the undeserved favor and blessing of God can then be poured out upon me. And that pours out in different ways. That pouring out expresses itself in a variety of ways. In Paul's life, it was poured out in his apostleship which wasn't you know, a job that I would have relished in the sense that God told him, I'm going to send you out to preach the gospel, but I'll also show you how many things you have to suffer for my namesake and, or because of the gospel. And we see that in Paul's story and his testimony. In fact, ultimately, as we talked in 2 Timothy, his, ultimately his uh, execution uh, by decapitation by, as a follower of Jesus Christ. But basically, he says that I am God's vessel. So he starts out talking about what God's vision for the world is, uh, how God, by his volition, controls all things in time and space and matter, and that now he tells us that the vehicle that he uses is the preaching of the gospel. And I think that a gospel which Paul goes on to say has been entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. So sometimes you hear people make reference to preaching the full gospel. And I, you know, I, at first I heard that I was very suspicious, almost like they're saying, well, I've got a franchise on the truth that you don't, you have to come and listen to me. But I think that what more centrally is understood in the idea of preaching the full gospel is that we don't leave anything out that is essential. And as I said yesterday, what's essential to me coming to a faith in Christ is that I recognize that people are dying eternally. People are going to go to hell in the most literal sense that, that the scripture describes it. The Bible never describes um, hell as being a figurative place. Jesus, who spoke about it 11 times in the Gospels, is very, very clear that it's the most unpleasant of experiences that it can even be imagined, and maybe how its horribleness can even be imagined. But saying all of that, Paul goes on to say that people can only hear that gospel if somebody preaches that gospel to them, if they communicate it to them. 
And I'm not saying that all of us are called to be preachers, but we have to realize that our very lives are supposed to be a declaration of the gospel. And what, one of the ways we do that, obviously without words, is by fastidiously and earnestly trying to live the life that God says I should live. To walk worthy, Paul said in Ephesians 4, of the calling wherewith we have been called. And what have I been called? I've been called to be a child of God. I've been called to be part of his kingdom. I'm part called to be a subject to him who is the king. The more I seek to live my life in conformity to what I understand is God's will for my life, and I will admit that my understanding of his will for my life increases and grows every day as I walk with him, but as I live within that earnestness, that the trajectory of my life is to be live more for Christ, not to get by with as little as I have to give, as I see that, I begin to proclaim the gospel through my life. And I'll find it not only by standing in front of a pulpit and preaching at people, which in some ways is kind of the easiest way to do it, but it's in those conversational moments. It's around the dinner table. It's it's in the in in the drive uh, in the car. It's oftentimes just simply letting other people around you see the commitment that you have, your your integrity, your honest, your willingness to be sacrificial and giving, and all of those things. Those are all ways in which we proclaim. That's what that word preaching means: is to declare that we declare that Christ is our Lord by living as if He is our Lord. And that is not only the most powerful message that we can give, the most powerful preaching, but it's also the part that when we fail at it becomes the biggest reproach to the gospel. When Paul was criticizing his Jewish brethren, he said that, you know, the Gentiles reproach the, the law because we are such hypocrites in how we live it. <laughs> we preach it, but we can't live up to it. And it's only, as Paul said in Acts 15, that we, or Peter said, that we come to this knowledge that neither we nor our fathers were ever to, able to live and fulfill the law, that he came to a realization, oh, wretched man, that I am, that I recognize that I am a sinner. So when Hillary Clinton called people like you and me the deplorables, instead of getting angry and offended, we should have said, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> I'm the deplorable. I'm the despicable me. Uh, Paul put it in really even harsh terms. He says, oh, wretched man that I am. And it's when we forget that we are sinners who have been saved by grace that we begin to develop that self-righteousness and that judgmentalism and that critical spirit we don't look at people who are making horrible life choices and feel pity for them and pray for them and, and have compassion upon them. We start becoming hateful. I had someone share with me the other day. They said, you know, I have to admit, I hate Joe Biden. And I said, well, you have to understand that Joe Biden is, first of all, only a caricature of him, his former self. And, and But secondly, he's only a brand. He, he doesn't, I don't know that he has any concept of, of what's going on or what he's doing. And that's the fearful thing because does he know that he's going to have to stand before God and give account for his life? That should be something that breaks our hearts and causes us to pray for his soul salvation. And so I just put that on you today. I said, you know, instead of mumbling and muttering about stupid government decisions, you should really be praying for these people. And I mean, there's a lot of them on both sides of the fence who really need Jesus. They, they may talk about being Christians or use his name or go to a church service, but they've never been born again. They've never really uh, come to that place where they fear God and acknowledge Him and worship Him as the only true God before whom they're going to have to stand before. So what we need to recognize is we need to be proclaiming that with our life and with our words, but also to realize, as Paul says lastly, that that's been entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. He was speaking of himself, particularly as an apostle, but it's true of us all. We have been entrusted with this treasure in earthen vessels, Paul would say to the Corinthians, that I may be this cracked bottle of bo uh, clay uh, vase, but inside of me is the Holy Spirit, the treasure of God. And I've been entrusted to let that light out. And here's a concept. How does the light get out most effectively? Well, cracked pots often leak light. And so you may have a lot of cracks and figures and failures, things that you do wrong. You know and I find that non-Christians oftentimes are kind of amazed by when they hear a Christian admitting their own failures and their own weaknesses and their own struggles, when we simply say, you know, I'm a sinner who's based saved by grace, and I know that 
because he saved me that he can save you and he can save anyone, that there's none of us who are outside the reach of God. That many times I, you know, I've over the years tried to remind people again and again who I was before I was saved. My whole phrase is I was young, I was stupid, I had absolutely no future. And I don't say that by exaggeration. I literally shudder when I think where my life would have ended up had I not come to Christ. And he, he took me anyway. <laughs> he, he took my life as, as, as worthless as it was becoming, and he made it a wonderful life. Not a carefree life, not an easy life necessarily, but he made it meaningful and wonderful and purposeful. And he could do that for you. He could do that for anybody because he did it for me. Well, we'll pick this up tomorrow, huh? God bless you and go in his grace.